This is the third program in a series taking place across the city this year uh, with the goal of creating a citywide conversation on the uh, painful and necessary discussion in history of 1919 and how that history continues in one way or another to haunt us today. This project has brought together cultural, cultural institutions from across the city, including the DeSable Museum of African American History, the Chicago History Museum, and the Newberry Library to organize these programs. And I hope you all picked up our fold-out flyer for all 11 programs uh, for, for the year. Now today's program, uh, we're gonna focus on the 1919 riots and their influence on housing and migration. Now, the 1919 riots were among the deadliest, uh, the riot was among the deadliest week in Chicago history with 35 dead and roughly 500 wounded. The riot was a response by white Chicagoans to the great migration of African Americans to the city of Chicago during World War I. Those black migrants sought decent housing as migrants before them had done, but white Chicagoans resented their movement into Chicago and their employment in places like the Chicago Stockyards and their, and their, and their participation in public life. The migrations, the resulting pressures on housing, and the racial violence of, the, of whites resulted in rioting in 1919 and beyond. It had a profound impact on the city, laying the groundwork for the segregated city that we live in today. Now, we're going to hear more about this history, and, but before we do that, we also want to hear your story. We believe, as we believe that the stories of individuals can reflect broader histories and that all voices in the city deserve to be heard. So, um, here's the outline of the day. First, we want to do a poll of the audience. Uh, we have a special polling system uh, that we'll show you in a moment where you can use your phone to anonymously, anonymously now, give your answers. We want, you to, under we, we, we want to understand where you are, uh, what you know, and, um, and where you're coming from, essentially. Then Brad Hunt, who's somewhere around here, raise your hand, Brad, wherever you are, there he is, there he is, uh, who's a historian at the Newberry Library, would do a presentation on the history of migration and housing in Chicago, centered around the 1919 race riots. We'll take questions and answers, but we'll do it in a special way. So uh, on your table, you'd notice, you'll notice these blue cards uh, we'll ask that you write out your questions and we'll collect them in order to have the questions read and discussed um, and engage the wider, the wider audience. Then this is where it gets real fun. So before I get into this, I should say, if you're lonely at a table by yourself, looks like nobody is, uh, I was gonna encourage you to move to a table with more people because we wanna hear your stories. We will use a special method called, the sto uh, called Story Circle that allows people to share, listen, and empathize. I think you'll find it a powerful and meaningful approach to storytelling. Finally, we want to hear about current efforts on the west side of Chicago to develop strong communities and to break down barriers and to improve people's lives. I'll be in conversation with Dr. Tanisha House, a longtime community leader here on the west side, and we'll discuss things like uh, what can be done, how can we improve what, what's happening and what's, already, and what's being done now. Um, and again, Tanisha House is a long time, long time community leader. Now, uh, about that survey, I mean, if you, if you will, all right. I'll ask you to pull out your phones and uh, you can direct your browser to uh, the website at the top of the page, menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com, and use the code 776249. And, uh, we'll, and then we'll go through a series of, of questions. So I guess I'll give you a minute to do that, right? Is everybody, everybody ready? No? No? Okay. All right. Got some time. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, Brad, the numbers can be, don't have to be, Brad, the numbers don't have to be separated. You can run them all together as you type them, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, 
There we go. So now a question should appear on your phones. A first question: Have you attended a program on the night? Have you attended a program on the yeah, Chicago 1919 race riots before? Click in your question. No. Look at all that. <laughs> Don't count today. Don't count today. Or maybe we should. All right. Okay. This one. All right. Next question: What is your zip code? Yeah, got a couple, got a couple, yeah. Good question, do you know where, which one we're in now? Got a good spread here, I mean, people from outside the city, north and south, and of course throughout the city. All right, everybody, everybody in? We'll go to the next question. In one word, in one word, what was the most important factor? No? Which one is that? Which, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Which, oh, yeah. What you got? Oh, no, no, this one. That's the okay. one. Whatever's on the screen. Okay. On a scale from, on a, one, on a one to ten scale, how much do you know about the following terms? The 1919 Chicago race riots, the Great Migration, redlining, and contract buying. You know, if you can gamble on these things, I would have put money on uh, on redlining, but I'm losing. All right. A lot about the Great Migration we know, um, and we'll learn more about a little bit more about that as the uh, sessions go on throughout the year. A uh, good amount on the, on the Chicago race riots, not much on contract buying, not as much on the contract buying. Interesting to know. So, what do you want to learn more about? relating to the 1919 race riots and their legacies. It'll start from, here we go. Good stuff, good stuff. Should give him some more time. Somebody said everything. That's, that's me, actually. So when some, someone said, what sparked the riots? Really important. These are questions we're going to work through today. How can we make reparations was one I think I just saw, restrictive covenants, again. What was, <laughs> what was the future Mayor Daly during, doing during the riots? That's a, that's a good one, that's a good one. one. One, as many of you know, is up to a lot of debate uh, uh, historically and discussion historically about Richard J. Daley, old man Daley, whether he was a participant in it uh, as part of, I think, Reagan's cults or not. Um, this, this is really helpful, and I will try to touch on some of these questions as I talk uh, in a minute. Good stuff, you all. Thank you. This is good. Can we go to the next one? All right, here's a question. Have you ever moved a long distance? Less than 100 miles, 100 to 1,000 miles, 1,000 to 3,000 miles. Move here from another country. Wow. Mm. Pick one. Just pick one. Yep, pick one.
That's right. That's right. So many in the audience have moved from far away, are not maybe resident Chicagoans, or born and raised in Chicago. Yeah. Although I'm curious now, just by a show of hands, just, just for kicks and giggles, how many of you have never moved? All right, one, one, at least one. Anybody else? All right, one. Maybe two, two. One more question. All right. All right. Two more questions. Two more questions. What are the three most important reasons for where you live now? Someone did. Someone. The East Bank Club. Who said that? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> That's three words, yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, thank you for sharing. Hey, indeed. Let's see. Yeah, hit, 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 the, hit the arrow key and we're. All People right. are still presenting, no? We've got oh, it. Oh, someone, you're still putting in? Still, still putting ones? Interesting, uh, what we have here, work, family, affordability. Um, these are things that, in a way, in a way factor into uh, the, the decision by many Southern African Americans to come to Chicago. There's the big reason that we know, escaping oppression. Uh, but, but, uh, but the job situation here, the job, the industry here, um, including the place where we are now, uh, the whole Sears plant plays a huge role in, in gathering up. So some of these things um, don't change. Of course, there's diversity, public transit, good stuff. Yep. Okay. That should do it. Andrew, I'm, I'm hitting it. the button now. It's done. All right. Great. All right. We're going to go back to the presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lee. Uh, I want to move us now to the next phase of our program, where uh, when we've done our first two programs here, I'm not not in this location. But uh, our first two programs, we got a lot of feedback that said people wanted to hear a little more history, a little more about what actually happened in 1919 and beyond. And so I'm going to walk through some slides to give you uh, my background as a historian of Chicago to talk about the events of that period and their long legacies. As we mentioned earlier, please write down questions as you go on a note card. We're going to pick those up towards the end of my presentation, and then we're going to try to filter those to get a sense of what uh, the audience is most interested in so that we can address your questions. This, again, is part of a larger project uh, where we've brought together 13 cultural partners across the city to really think hard about this 100th anniversary of the Chicago 1919 race riots. And I should add that this has been funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities as a community conversation. So we've wanted to do this where we really do get your input and hear um, from various audiences around town. We've done programs at the DuSable. We did one in Woodlawn, this one here in North Lawndale. And we're going to continue to do programs around the city throughout the year. I want to start and talk about migration, housing, and want to just make sure everyone understands Chicago's long trajectory in terms of its population boom. Because if we're going to talk about migration uh, and how we're going to get to 1919, we have to understand that Chicago was one of the boom cities of the 19th century. Population exploded between 1860 here uh, at the bottom, 1850, 1860, and 1930. 
uh, when it peaks, and it peaks right after World War II, around 1950. So masses of migrants have come to Chicago. My, Chicago is defined by its immigrant community. It has always been a place where immigrants have arrived, have come, uh, and settled. And so when I talk about the great migration of African Americans, we have to remember Chicago has always been a city of immigrants, but African Americans are going to get treated differently, and we need to recognize that. So when immigrants arrived before World War I, they often ended up in what we today would have called slum housing, immigrant housing. There's a famous report from 1901. I encourage you to find at our library. The Newberry has it. It's a great work. It's in a lot of libraries in Chicago called Tenement Conditions in Chicago, documenting the really awful housing conditions of immigrants when they first arrived. Um, but we have this myth in Chicago that, oh, communities are homogeneous ethnically. And Jane Addams explodes this in some of her work. And this is an image from uh, reports that she commissioned uh, out of Hull House in the early, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, that looks at ethnicity on the near west side. Now, this is a jumble of colors. What does this all mean, Brad? Uh, the blue uh, boxes are housing occupied primarily by Italians. The yellow is primarily German. The red is primarily Russian. Uh, the uh, light green is Irish, of course. But what this says is that this idea that there are certain neighborhoods that are only Irish or only German or only Italian, no. When whites move into neighborhoods, it's a mix. Yes, there are certain blocks that are more Italian than others. There are certain blocks that may be even entirely Italian, but the community as a whole was never entirely homogeneous. What's going to happen for African Americans in Chicago's history is that as they moved into communities, whites moved out, and communities were almost entirely black uh, in Chicago, which is unlike any other migration experience. When African Americans came to Chicago in 1918, they came for job opportunities. They came to escape Jim Crow, uh, the discriminatory policies of the South, and to es escape oppressive agricultural regimes uh, like sharecropping that uh, were not providing any kind of fairness, let alone opportunity. And with the train was a critical uh, method by which people arrived in 1918. Remember, the Model T is still kind of a new, uh, just a growing uh, mode of transportation. And so what we found, and this was a, a, from the Encyclopedia of Chicago, that these rail lines coming from New Orleans, the Illinois Central Lines coming out of New Orleans, also for, to a lesser extent out of Georgia, made this a tremendous flow of migrants, particularly from that Mississippi Delta region, and brought people to Chicago, uh, as well as other, um, er, other cities along Illinois, but mostly to this city, which offered the most opportunity, in part because um, there were housing opportunities here as well. But when the African Americans arrived and settled in uh, Chicago, their homes often got attacked, particularly if they were moving into neighborhoods that were formerly white. And so this is a map that shows, it's from the 1922 report about the riots, and it shows various dots where houses were bombed. And many of them were along this line moving south, which was pushing south from the Black Belt into white communities. As African Americans tried to move into neighborhoods that had formerly been all white, their homes got attacked. Note the dates here. July 1, 1917 to March 1, 1921, were before the 1919 race riots. So I want to tell you about the riots in a second, but I want, don't want you to think that, oh, one thing happened, all of a sudden riots happened. These things developed over time in a tremendous amount of racial tension, mostly from whites who felt threatened as African Americans moved into their communities. The riots, though, get sparked, do get sparked by one incident, and it's along a beach in uh, the 26th Street and between 26th Street and 31st Street uh, on Chicago's south side. Uh, Eugene Williams and four of his friends, uh, Eugene was 17 at the time, had a homemade raft that they had constructed out of wood. They kept it on the beach. They went to go uh, put it in the water in Lake Michigan, and they drifted to the wrong side of an imaginary white 
color line separating beaches around 26th Street and beaches around 29th Street. The 29th Street beach was by custom, if not law, for whites, the 26th Street beach uh, being for African Americans. So he crossed this imaginary line. You can imagine how easy that would be to do given currents and winds and, uh, along Lake Michigan. Uh, he's hit by a rock thrown by uh, a white man and when the police refuse to arrest the white man, uh, African Americans are visibly uh, are upset and try to get the police officer to arrest him. Uh, eventually a shot is fired and all hell breaks loose. Um, it, this is partly the police unable to control the situation, but this was a tinderbox. I don't want people to think that, well, if Eugene Williams had never gotten hit by a rock uh, on his head, that everything would have been fine. Hardly. Uh, this was just one event that sparked a, a very massive week of violence in Chicago. Uh, and that riot that sweeps Chicago is really a white riot. These are generally white groups from the neighboring areas moving through the African-American community, what's then called Bronzeville and, and the Black Belt, uh, and attacking whites, shooting up neighborhoods, driving cars, and sh uh, doing what we now call drive-by shootings. and. Uh, generally uh, terrorizing that community. It's important to note that African Americans fought back, that many of them, uh, that several, uh, many of the returning veterans who had been in World War I uh, fought in the war and knew how to defend themselves. Um, but primarily, we have to think of this as a effort by white Chicagoans to intimidate and drive out if you will, uh, African Americans, an effort to, to, to terrorize them uh, out of their housing choices and also out of employment opportunities, particularly in the stockyards. The whole event uh, eventually gets quelled by the state militia who arrive about day four after a whole lot of dithering by government officials. Uh, the state militia, interestingly enough, were mostly suburban whites from the North Shore. Uh, interestingly, they just did not, uh, they, they just brought 5,000 state militia in to keep the peace. This is not a real effort to take sides or to uh, remedy any injustices that might have occurred. But it, that plus the rain, plus a rainstorm, did help to quell the violence by early, the first week of August, 1919. But as this cartoon in the Chicago Tribune makes clear, what the real significance of this is that uh, the North was going to be just as vigilant in establishing and creating racial boundaries as the American South. Whereas the American South had Jim Crow, the North was gonna develop distinct color lines, particularly around housing, and where people can live. The 1922 report on the riots described what was called a deadline. And by deadline, I don't mean when, the, when my students' papers are due. No, deadline means you cross this line, and it was Wentworth Avenue in 1919, and you risked dying if you were African American, if you went west of Wentworth Avenue. So this is um, part of the, uh, the uh, the, the era of the time, and you can see this deadline really clear, clearly here. So Wentworth Avenue is right there, and it was just this known boundary. Today, Wentworth Avenue runs along the Dan Ryan Expressway uh, and is, parallels it, but you can just tell here uh, on this map of where African Americans lived in 1920 what the boundary was. I should add that we're on the west side. There is a sizable African American population on the west side. Uh, as well as on the near north side in what today we think of as uh, the Cabrini-Green community. There are little dots elsewhere, and you can tell that uh, there are areas where uh, African Americans are living, but in very small numbers. So the right response to 1919 is several fold. One, Baha'u's bombings continue. That map I showed you earlier showed bombings through 1921. The second is more legalistic, and it's called restrictive covenants. And restrictive covenants were legal documents attached to a property that, that limited who the property could be sold to. And this map's a little hard to see, so I'm going to zoom in on it. And this is the Black Belt. 
we, it's Grand Boulevard, Oakland, Douglas neighborhoods, but this was thought of as the Bronzeville community and the Black Belt of Chicago. Uh, at the time, these are, this is a map from 1947. Uh, these dotted areas are where restrictive covenants are. Uh, the restrictive covenants are placed on properties around the Black Belt, and it basically says, you shall not sell your property to a person of color. And these were legally enforceable until 1948, when the Supreme Court struck down restrictive covenants. But uh, to go back to this map, these restrictive covenants are all over the city. Um, they're, they're on the north side as well. I'm sorry, I have a second zoom here of the west side. So here we are, we're right around, uh, we're, we're right about here in this area. And you can see the African American community here by 1948 along these two belts. And in this case, surrounded by restrictive covenants. In this case, not. Uh, certain areas were better at, real estate agents were better at creating these covenants and handing them around and neighbors actively spread this. Uh, by going door to door and saying, you need to attach this covenant to your property, sign here. And in fact, in the records of the Newberry Library in 1925, we were pressured to sign restrictive covenants for property around the Newberry that the Newberry held. And to our great shame, we did uh, in 1925 and 26. We have those records. Uh, it, we were part of the problem, and I think it's important for institutions to, to own up to that. And th we were right here on the near north side. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of pressure uh, from neighbors uh, to sign those covenants in an effort to prevent African Americans from moving in. The government response, we had, the, we had just told you the real estate response was this restrictive covenant idea that lasts till 1948, but the federal government is also in on this. In order to get, um, the, the housing market changes in, in around the 1920s as loans become more affordable, but when the real revolution is in the 1930s when the federal government creates federally guaranteed mortgages. Today, when if you and I buy a house, we can get a mortgage backed by the federal government. That allows the bank to give us the loan, knowing that, Brad, if you don't pay, the government's going to come in and repay the bank. So those federally guaranteed mortgages, uh, however, the, the government's very interested in making sure it gives safe mortgages. So it draws up huge maps for every city across the country, and these are online. And these maps showed red-lined areas. In this case, it's kind of pink. The pink areas are labeled fourth grade or declining. And um, there's, a, there's another term for the fourth grade. It's, like, it's an F. It means we are not going to guarantee mortgages on property in those red districts. The yellow districts is the third grade, and that's, it's even there, it's very cautious. And the only areas where the government will, no matter what uh, the project is, it, uh, will pay for, will guarantee a mortgage are the blue areas. And where are the blue areas? They're on the edge of the city, they're in the suburbs. But these are driven, as much as anything, by race. Where do, who are the people who live in those neighborhoods? Not necessarily the condition of the housing. There's a little bit of condition of the housing, but not necessarily. So let me give you an example. We're right here. We are on uh, Homan Street near the Sears plant. Sorry, now where am I? Sorry, I'm a little confused. This is North Lawndale as a whole. Here's the boulevard of North Lawndale. Here's Douglas Park. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, a little, um, I'm having a hard time finding us on the map. The, this area here is in the middle of North Lawndale, and it's labeled red. And why? Because African Americans had a handful of African Americans and moved in in the 1930s. So all it took was this potential for racial change for the federal government to say, no, we don't want a loan in that area. And as soon as you stop allowing banks to lend in those areas because you're not going to guarantee those mortgages, then disinvestment takes place. You can't, you have to go to other markets to borrow money. People have to borrow money from various sources and it just, it makes buying a house uh, that much more difficult. So redlining draws red lines on maps 
in order to discourage, and it has the effect of discouraging investment. The same thing is going to happen with insurance. Insurance companies are going to draw maps and say, we're not even going to insure your property. Now you're really uh, without a safety net. So redlining is a government response. It lasts through the 1970s. Finally, the um, 1974 um, Fair Housing Act uh, is going to do a good deal. The 1968 Fair Housing Act, as well as the 1974 amendments and the 1984 uh, amendments as well, are going to start to fight some of these negative impacts along um, lending money. But what's happening in the black community? Okay, so World War I, Great Migration, lots of African Americans coming up for jobs, opportunities, and to escape the Jim Crow South. The 1930s are a depression, not many migrants. The 1940s, World War II, again more opportunities, and a second Great Migration of African Americans is going to arrive from the South, not always by train, now sometimes by car, uh, but certainly an a even larger number uh, come to Chicago, and the city's African American population goes to about 28% around 1950. So the second Great Migration uh, is, is different in that the job opportunities available now are, are greater, and the prosperity of African Americans in the Black Belt is greater. Still relative to whites, uh, they're facing all sorts of job discrimination, but culturally this is a, a high point within a discrimination, within a discriminatory regime. If you're uh, in a, the Black Belt thrives despite its segregation, uh, but I don't want to in any way paint that this is a good thing, but um, what's going to happen is that when African Americans are crammed into the Black Belt, they are going to produce um, a, a tremendous cultural scene, uh, particularly captured here by Archibald Motley uh, in a painting called Bronzeville at Night. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not trying to say this was good, but this is the, the adaptations that are made by immigrants in this community, by migrants in this community. But the black population is going to expand, and what's happening here is twofold. One, that these boundaries are starting to break down. These deadlines here are still here, but eventually they're going to expand. This is 1950, 1960, and the black belt grows because so many people are arriving. It's the, uh, this one historian has called the efforts by whites a containment policy. Well, it's going to expand. This is like containment in Europe after World War II to contain the communists. Well, we might lose Poland and half of Germany, but we're going to keep West Germany and maybe Italy. Uh, in this case, it's uh, we're, neighborhoods like Englewood are going to racially transition. Whoops. Racially transition from black to white. From white, excuse me, from white to black. Here's Englewood, the little, uh, there is a, a black community in Englewood in 1950. By 1960, Englewood has completely racially transitioned. Same for transitions on the west side, including the North Lawndale community, which has a, a sprinkling, which had some African Americans in 1950. By 1960, all the whites have basically fled. So the Great Migration and the, this racial transition is taking place, and it's all about race. This is about race. We have to be straight about that. And you know, it was very interesting in the word cloud where we talk about why we choose neighborhoods. If you'd ask people in 1950 and 1960 why they chose neighborhoods and why they left their neighborhoods, they would have said race, uh, that they left because they didn't want to live next to African Americans. There's another government response here, and this is going to make things worse in various black communities. And while African Americans in these neighborhoods wanted their neighborhoods cleaned up, they wanted city services, they wanted the same kinds of things every other community wanted, street lights that work, garbage picked up, sewers fixed, job opportunities. Um, the government's response instead is going to be to label these communities slums and to start clearing them aggressively. Urban renewal public housing, highways, 
All these things are going to really devastate the urban fabric. And here's, uh, I'm going to go zoom in on this one. This is Bronzeville. This is a very large area cleared. This is the uh, church on the corner of King Drive and 37th, 33rd. I know it's 33rd. I can't remember the church. Maybe Lee remembers it. That, and this is the Lake Meadows community. Tear down the old, build new housing from a government perspective. Oh, we're, we're, we're cleaning up the neighborhood. We're doing, you know, we're cleaning up the slums. But the, the violence that happens when you bulldoze and wipe away a community is significant. This one also shows some public housing communities here uh, being built as well. Uh, the models, they, this, it, what happened wasn't even the full extent of what people wanted to happen. There was a plan to redo the entire south side uh, with a lot more towers and even a lot more clearance and rebuilding. This stretches all the way from 18th Street along the lakefront all the way down to the University of Chicago here. So the idea was to take that whole south side Bronzeville lakefront community, wipe it away, rebuild, and um, think this was a form of progress. Uh, it's certainly part of the optimism of the post-war period. How would we won the World War II? Because we built more tanks and planes and ships. Um, how can we win the battle against the slums? Let's tear it down and build more houses uh, then and build them in modern style. Uh, this is part of my research on public housing has been about uh, this clearance. We built a whole lot of public housing in these communities to replace uh, what was there before. It was difficult to sustain these as communities in the same way they had been before. I want to turn to one other idea that we mentioned in the, in the uh, survey about contract buying. And this is a fabulous book. It's about this neighborhood. It's called Family Properties, Beryl Satter. It's a book that she tells about her father, who was a real estate lawyer, trying to fight racism in this community. And the real estate practices really were incredibly damaging. Let me tell you about contract buying. Contract buying, because remember I said if you were black and you lived in these communities, you couldn't get a loan? Well, how are you going to buy that house? Unscrupulous real estate agents would say, OK, you can't get a loan. Well, don't worry. I'll let you have this house, and it will be on a rent-to-own basis. You will rent, but you will not have the deed to this property. You will not own this property. You will rent it from me. And if you pay me for 10 years, 15 years, on time, every month, then you will eventually, at the end, I will transfer the deed to you. Well, that's a recipe for exploitation. And here's why. If you miss one payment, you no longer own the house, and it goes back to the unscrupulous real estate person. Uh, there's no protection in the same way that people who borrow money from a bank have protection because they actually own the property, and someone, uh, you know, that, that foreclosure process affords a lot more protection to the buyer. So uh, also getting these things fixed up when they go bad, nope, those rental contracts are like, that's your problem. The roof leaks, your problem. The, the plumbing backs up, your problem. If you rent in Chicago today and the plumbing backs up, you call the landlord and hope they fix it. Uh, in these cases, that was not happening. And so what happens is, is that people do everything they can to make that payment, neglecting other things. Um, real estate, then they may not fix the roof because if you spend money to fix the roof, then you can't pay the landlord and, I mean, the, the, the contract, I'll pay on your contract, and you might lose your house. So housing is going to go downhill in these communities. This is taking place at the same time as other disinvestment and job opportunities are, are evaporating. And so um, as the, by the 1970s, this becomes a real crisis in communities like North Lawndale. This is one of the reasons Martin Luther King shows up in North Lawndale, down the street, Hamlin Avenue, about half a mile from here, because he's on a campaign to end the slums. And one of the things he tries to tackle are uh, these uh, contract buying schemes. Here he is in an apartment building on Hamlin Avenue. Um, he rallies the community through a series of speeches. Of course, he goes over uh, to Marquette Park to, for a rally, gets hit on the head with a brick. Uh, it's all, um, as he says, there's more hate here in the North than he's seen in the South. Um, and ultimately, he's unsuccessful in tackling contract buying. It's going to take the community really to rise up 
and demand change in this. And eventually what's going to happen is the Contract Buyers League is going to be central in convincing the county sheriff not to throw people out of their houses and resist, resist the evictions that are happening. And eventually uh, reforms are going to be put in place and contract buying is going to uh, eventually uh, die. However, I'm, it's very intriguing that after the 2008-9 real estate crash, we've seen a revival of contract buying uh, in, many, in many communities. And it deeply concerns me. Um, let me bring it up to the, the present here. We, I have a few more slides, and then we want to move on to uh, some of our, our, our storytelling. In 2010, this is a map, a very sophisticated map of Chicago region uh, that has one dot per person, if you will. And we still have today in Chicago a tremendous amount of segregation, even though the laws have changed, even though we now recognize that segregation is wrong, even though uh, you can now, with maybe with some difficulty, but not nearly as much difficulty, get a bank loan if you're a person of color. Um, but these orange dots, uh, I'm sorry, the green dots are African Americans, many of whom, of whom have moved to the suburbs uh, in the 1970s. After the Fair Housing Act of 1968 and other reforms in 1974, people were able to buy houses in the suburbs as mortgage money now became available. But again, it's a resegregation process more than an integration process. The blue is white. Those are the, this goes all the way out to Aurora, by the way. This is Aurora, Elgin, North Shore, South Suburbs, downtown. I hope everybody can figure that out. The blue north side of Chicago, the orange uh, Latino, Hispanic Latino. There are a handful of neighborhoods you can identify here as multiracial, like Hyde Park, parts of the South Loop, uh, and, and various communities, some interesting communities out in the uh, west suburbs, I'm thinking of Bolingbrook here and, and others. Um, but for the most part, these are surprisingly, we're, we're still surprisingly uh, living in homogeneous communities. This is just the city itself, and here you even get you get a stronger sense than of Hyde Park, to a lesser extent the South Loop. But how deeply uh, isolated, not isolated, you know, deeply segregated African Americans remain on this map, even as their boundaries of that their communities have expanded. Let me show you just a few slides in North Lawndale, just to give you, again, a sense of this community. This is so close to downtown. This is the former Sears plant that dominated and produced jobs in this community. I've talked a lot about migration and housing. People migrated for jobs. They wanted to live near their jobs. When those jobs disappear, the people disappear. And so many of these communities have witnessed depopulation, uh, particularly on the west side and on the south side in part because jobs are no longer the industrial jobs of the first half of the 20th century. Instead, we're now in an information age economy when the jobs are showing up downtown uh, and not so much out here. It's hard to imagine, but look at this block here. This whole block, I'm going to show you, the next slide is going to show you what that Sears plant looked like. There used to be a huge Sears factory here when this was where they published their catalogs, the Sears Roebuck catalogs, which was the Amazon of its day, and uh, employed tens of thousands of people in the surrounding communities. There is no employer uh, that employs tens of thousands of people uh, in Chicago in the same way today. So this, our power plant, where we are right now, just so you know, is this little smokestack. This was a power plant that powered up this whole thing. The tower across the street is the main surviving element, as is this building, the administration building for the company. North Lawndale has gone through a tremendous uh, decline, and, but is now uh, reviving, and we're going to hear from Tanisha House. Uh, the disinvestment leads to vacant lots uh, and leads to the kind of um, dis, uh, disinvestment of the community that we're all, uh, with, with the discourages us all. Home and square housing, it was, this was built on some of the former Sears land, and it's across the street. 
If you're not from this community, I encourage you to drive around. And this was built uh, in the early 2000s, and there's a community center and other new developments that are trying to provide affordable housing as well as a new sense of community here in North Lawndale. The community has been planning for many of these activities. In 2005, with the help of the MacArthur Foundation and LISC, the local, um, the LISC, the local initiative support, no, I can't remember the, I'm, I'm wrong on the acronym there. Uh, and it, they produced a plan that is trying to re revive community around what do the residents really want? And it may not always be new housing. It may often be better relations with the police or better uh, community spaces that are readily identifiable. Uh, and the things that they're looking for are not necessarily the things that the planners have always thought uh, to be important. I'm going to end here with a couple of slides. This is where we are in the Home and Square Community Center across the street. These are down the street. These are new anchors for this community. And they have been in this building. This is an image that shows where they were in this room uh, last year, or two years ago, excuse me, doing new round, new round of community planning to update their 2005 plan. And I, Tanisha, I think Dr. Tanisha will... Uh, We'll talk about some of this work that they've done. Last slide. I want to impress upon everybody how important migration and immigrants are to Chicago and to Chicago's future. We talked about 1919 race riots and how they divided the city. But if I had one takeaway for the present, it would be we need more migrants. We need more immigrants to this city. Chicago, unlike Chicago, in my mind, is done better than other cities, Cleveland, Detroit, and St. Louis, which have struggled more than this city, uh, in part because we in, there's a huge influx of Latinos to counteract the flight of whites out of this city. Cleveland, Detroit, and St. Louis, however, did not attract immigrants, either Asian immigrants or Hispanic immigrants, to nearly the same extent. And as a result, they experienced a much steeper overall population decline. That gives you fewer taxpayers. That gives you more abandoned properties. That gives you uh, a city that feels like it's spiraling down. Whereas Chicago, although it has many, many, many problems, is not nearly uh, struggling to the extent that Detroit, Cleveland, and St. Louis are. This is not about the, the great migration. The great migration here can, is what expands this red line. Um, but the number of African Americans in Chicago has been declining by 200,000 in the last decade. 180, I'm sorry, 200,000 between uh, 2000 and 2010, and we've been continuing to lose African Americans from the city, and we're not gaining others and, and in the same extent. Hispanic migration has leveled off. And so where are the next immigrants going to come from? Chicago has always been a city of immigrants who have arrived from all sorts of places. Where are the next people going to come from? And where are they going to, uh, to how, how well is the city going to welcome them as we repopulate uh, large portions of, of the city? So I'm going to end there. We have been, uh, with the cards are... Can I suggest that everyone hand the cards to uh, to people? There's always there's one person from our organization, our our group, at every table, and if that person can raise their hands, I'll collect the cards right here. I, I forgot to mention I was supposed to get the cards collected. We're going to take a minute to get a sense of the question and answers. Um, my apologies. Sorry, Karen. I was supposed to ask for the. I got excited about my. What I was saying? We're a little long. You got a few cards? Why don't you? Yeah, let's just sort through them. Yeah, good questions. Good questions. Lots of good questions. So, how do you want, do you want me to read and you answer, or what? Are you yeah, what do you? For now, yeah, pick out, pick out. The first one you really like. I just wanted you to know. So yeah. Answer I'll answer. Yeah, why don't you read it? So how, how about I read them and you answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I don't know if you want that one. We're collecting the cards and let's, uh, we're going to filter through those. Okay. 
You got a good one, Lee? So somebody has a topical question. What do you think of the Lincoln Yards plan that will give $1.6 billion in TIF money to high-end developers that Mayor Emanuel has pushed through? Yeah, the Lincoln Yards is this former uh, industrial area that used to provide a lot of jobs as those industrial areas have uh, no longer provide those opportunities or as those plants are moved elsewhere, what are we going to do with that uh, land? The problem with the Lincoln Yards project, very briefly, is that, uh, yes, that TIF, that tax increment financing district that creates a bucket of money that's going to allow the infrastructure improvements, it, it's too large. It's too much money. It's, it's not a priority uh, for the city right now to spend a billion dollars on one neighborhood when there we have so many other problems with our schools. Uh, developers uh, are, the city is not being a good negotiator when it does that. I'm, I'm not about against turning that area into housing and retail, but the public input and the money being spent is not well done. I would be opposed to it as the current mayor, or the next mayor, I believe is. People are no longer people are no longer moving to the suburbs for greater opportunity. Mm. They are moving because they can't afford Chicago. Amen mm. to that. What can be done to stop the push out? Yeah, good question. So gentrification is a concern in many communities where housing prices are rising, taxes are then going up as your property becomes more valuable. People are moving to the are not moving to the suburbs. That question said people are moving to the suburbs but in not, part but because but for different reasons. But for different because reasons because some, some are being pushed out because of housing costs, absolutely. Uh, but there's interesting studies that look at the cost of transportation and housing. And so if you do move far out and you have to drive a long way to work, you're actually, when you look at those two together, you might be better off living closer to work, paying more for housing and less for transportation. And so there's a very interesting set of studies from the Metropolitan Planning Council on that that are trying to combat the notion that, oh, my housing costs are so high, so I gotta move way out, but now I spend a fortune on my car and on driving. Um, you know, and, and time on, on that as well. But yes, the affordable housing is a serious problem in this city, uh, and as is um, rising ta uh, taxes that are um, rising very rapidly and some that are gentrifying. I don't have an answer on that one. That's another program. Yeah. Am I still on here? Yeah, there we go. I'm back on. Uh, after World War II, Japanese Americans uh, resettled in Chicago, many from internment camps. And there we are. And some of them, yes, did face uh, discrimination moving into, particularly in white communities on the north side, but it was not the same as. Don't we have a third microphone? We do. Let me go to this one. Uh, I, I think my. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. No, I. Working here. We'll try to charge these during the story circle session. Uh, yeah. That they Japanese Americans did not face the same level of discrimination did that African Americans did moving into their communities, and I think that's the story of race in Chicago. Ah. That deadline going the other way. Yes. That's one. Two is what's the impact of lack of investment by the Chicago Park District on the on south and west side in south and west side communities? Okay. The first one is about when whites moved into uh, went, crossed the Wentworth deadline and were now in the Black Belt. Did they face violence uh, during the riots? Yes. As African Americans fought back, particularly if people came in with. Um, clearly, obviously, aggressive attentions, intentions. And so uh, the whites who died during the riots were usually, uh, there were some who were randomly attacked, certainly, but most were uh, doing these battles in the city um, when they were wounded or injured or died. The um, divide was much more riskier for an African American crossing east or crossing west of that Wentworth line. Uh, they really risked uh, their lives in ways that others did not. 
And then the park district, I'm not sure on that one. Uh, the park district's investments today or in the past, yeah, I, I'm just not, I, I don't feel qualified to answer that one about the park district. All Sorry. Right, then then uh, one last one. What do you think is the greatest need in Chicago? What do you think is the greatest need in Chicago housing policy today? Uh, what is the greatest need in Chicago housing policy today? The housing policy cannot be a one-size solution. There is no one solution. If somebody said, let's just do this and we're going to build a lot more um, of something. No, it takes a whole strategy that is requires a whole set of strategies for everything from additional homeless shelters, additional, uh, 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 the, the term is called assisted living, and um, um, I'm blanking on the term for uh, the next level up for wrapping people who are homeless with services, everything to slight subsidies for some families so they can stay in their house as the taxes go up in a gentrifying community. We do need to build some new things. We need to have this ordinance enforced where developers who build a certain size building have to have more than X percent, I believe it's 10 percent of their units affordable. Right now they're dodging that to pay into an affordable housing fund that's doing okay, but it could be better if we had that affordable housing in those new buildings that are going up. Uh, it's a whole range of policies. There's no one size fits all. These are very complicated issues, and each community, you know, we, what we need is real leadership to say, this is a serious problem. We've got to tackle it. It's, you know, when, when Jefferson Park, they tried to build 30 units of affordable housing in Jefferson Park and the community went bonkers, that's the kind of stuff that's, you know, and it's about race, it's about class, it's about those things that are continuing to hamper this city as they did in the past, as they have for 100 years now. We haven't gotten over our hang up around race, ethnicity, and housing. And that's discouraging. Um, and I hope we're, we're making some progress, but we're still a long way to go. All right, all right. Uh, big hand for Brad taking the, all that off. Thank you. All right, now this is the fun part, right? We're going to go to the story circle uh, portion of our day. Um, and essentially, the question that you're going to answer and talk about and story tell about is, is this. Tell, tell us a story about a time when you had to move. Tell us a story about a time when you had to move. If you're at a table that's a little light on people, move to a table with more. But I think, I think you guys are pretty straight. And then there's, there'll be some facilitators uh, for, at every table uh, from our group who can help you through the, the process. Great. All right, folks, thank you. Thank you for uh, your attention. And I'm sorry to interrupt. I know you guys have had a great conversation. I hope it was really uh, and, and, you know, engaging and that uh, the story circle method produced some really uh, reflection, reflective stories and, and just some moments that were kind of magical. Uh, we had some of that at my table. And I'm really just uh, delighted. I, we do want to hear um, from our next uh, guest, Dr. Uh, Tanisha House. And I'm going to uh, let Lee guide a conversation with Dr. House, uh, who has been a longtime uh, community activist here in uh, the North Lawndale community. And you guys will tell, tell, your, tell her, or you will tell your story. Great. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, indeed, we have Dr. Dr. Tanisha House, and I'm going to get her title wrong, and she's going to correct me, so just so you, just so you know, uh, an, or, an organizational change consultant, and she's done work for the New Covenant Community Development Corporation here in North Lawndale, and she's participated in the North Lawndale, coordinating, North Lawndale Community Coordinating Council's work to improve the area, but you're, you, there's another wrinkle to your... Am I on now? Okay, thank you. So I'm actually a community organizer for North Lawndale Community Coordinating Council and New Covenant Community Development Corporation. So I have multiple hats. 
uh, as a community organizer, I've done quite a bit of work in the North Lawndale community to create a quality of life and comprehensive plan to revitalize the North Lawndale community, in addition to some of the other organiza organizations uh, to support redevelopment in the west, on the west side of Chicago. And then I'm also an entrepreneur, do training and development for a number of different organizations who need assistance with leadership development, organizational change, and also organizing in general. All right, all right, all right. So let me just, so let, let's just start here. Now, a lot of the conversation that we've had today um, and the history we've seen, seen today, a lot of it is a South Side story, right? I mean, the riots happened on the South Side. Um, you know, Eugene Williams who got hit with a brick in Lake Michigan, obviously happens on the South Side. But as it plays out, ramifications of that brick, of that violence plays out across the city over the next century. Um, by mid-century and afterwards, the West Side, North Lawndale in particular, really becomes this focal point in terms of housing and out-migration of white people and contract buying and all those kind of things. Can you give us a sense, this is before you were born, I know, but can you give us a sense of what things were like uh, here on the West Side into the 60s and 70s and 80s? What was the climate here? So from a historical standpoint, uh, I unfortunately can't give you a sense of what it was like because I'm not a historian. However, what I do know is um, Martin Luther King Jr. was here for a short period of time, just for a few months, uh, on 16th Street regarding housing issues and housing discrimination in particular. And so uh, those issues still exist today. Uh, there was another individual who worked very closely with some other people who were part of the Black Panthers, and actually it was Jack McNamara who uh, has supported individuals who have been um, basically pre pred predatory uh, individual, individuals who have been preyed upon by pre predatory lenders who uh, created contracts that were not uh, uh, deed attached, but they were contracts to uh, manipulate people, take their money, uh, but assured them that they would actually have housing, and that housing would only probably be temporary because they'd under, they did not understand the nuances that were outlined in the contract. And so many individuals lost their homes and their hard-earned money because of those type of predatory uh, lending practices. Uh, today, uh, the issue still exists because redlining still exists. Uh, in addition to that, when you look at redlining um, from uh, a standpoint of individuals not allowing, or organizations, I should say banks, not allowing individuals to obtain loans uh, who are blacks in particular, uh, that's been a challenge that we have to overcome, despite the fact that they may have the dollars to actually uh, put down towards the home. And we know that there oftentimes have been uh, counterparts who are white who may not even have the same level of, uh, uh, same amount of money, uh, level of education, and or just, uh, again, financial wherewithal who have been given opportunities to own. In addition to some of the organizations that have been uh, agency partners who are supposed to be providing support to those who are uh, maybe marginalized and or ostracized or have not had access to uh, capital to support rehabbing properties as well as to uh, being able to acquire property. Uh, so there are a lot of injustices, inequities that exist today, not only in North Lawndale, but as an advocate for the west side of Chicago. Uh, my hope is that we can change these, uh, these un injustices and provide some equitable opportunities for everyone who desires to own. Uh, home ownership is, it should be a right for everyone. And unfortunately, that right has been uh, stripped from many of those who desire ownership and who should have that right to own. Now, Dr. House, how do you, that's a lot of stuff to combat, how do you fight against that? And I guess for some people, it may be surprising with fair housing laws and fair lending laws that we still have to tackle the same problems in 2019 as we did in 1959. Uh, but, but, but how do you, how does your work and work of others, how do you combat this? So one of the issues that has been faced in North Lawndale has been galvanizing everybody so that the people can be on one accord and working together in unity to be able to change the community as a whole, which would also include housing. Because today, as it stands in the North Lawndale community, it has been reported, and I state it's been reported, that there is about 36,000 people in this community. Uh, this is where you are today is the North Lawndale community. Uh, when I was growing up, I didn't know that this area was North Lawndale. I knew I just grew up on the west side of Chicago. So when you think about how uh, Chicago has been segregated by 
the nomenclature of this community is North Lindell, that community is East Garfield, West Garfield, Austin, North and South Austin. Uh, I was born in North Lindell at Mount Sinai Hospital, raised in East Garfield and in Austin community. But at that time, as, I, as a young person, I just knew West Side. I am from the West Side of Chicago, not those different places. So part of it is making certain that we can stand in unity and not divide ourselves by uh, saying, oh yeah, I'm North Lawndale, I'm Austin, we're the West Side of Chicago. And in that, it's not to pit ourselves against the South Side because I think there are a lot of issues that are the same yet, similarities, but at the same time, there's some differences mm -hmm. on the West Side. As a matter of fact, in conversation with somebody recently, uh, we had a one-to-one -one meeting and she grew up on the South Side of the Chicago, but now she's living on the West Side. And one of her comments was, the West Side is different. She said, and I said, how so? She said, well, it seems more dry of resources than the South Side of Chicago. And I believe that to be true to some extent, and on a personal note, as it relates to business ownership, I think there's a lot of truth to that because when you look at the South Side, there are a lot more entrepreneurs that seem to appear throughout the community, but when you come to the West Side, you don't necessarily see that same type of business model or practices uh, on this side of town. And so it really requires unity. That was a long answer, but it requires unity, and the unity in that we can actually stand together and move things forward with co-ops and economic capital. We build our own uh, systems and, and in the midst of being in an institutional racist world or in, in a systematic world that preys upon those who they're marginalizing, uh, we have to be able to stand together and, and move at the sound of what I always say, and I'm a woman of faith, I say move with the cadence of the Holy Spirit and as, as one without being moved or bothered by those who are trying to stop or, or cre create barriers for us because we have money, mm -hmm. but the biggest issue is that unity and being able to put that money together mm -hmm. so that we are not afraid of who's gonna be ahead of the other. Right, right, right. And, 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 and so to that, if we were having this conversation 50 years ago, 60 years ago, the, the, the barriers or, the, or the, the people who were responsible for those barriers would have been banks, insurance companies, real estate agents in, in many regards. Uh, the same forces you fight against today or are there new players in the mix? I think, that it, unfortunately, when you look at history, <laughs> you have the same issues because you have the same systems. The players might be different, but the systems are still the same. They have not changed. So it's up to us to create I hate to use a term like our own uh, uh, type of utopia of sorts, but that's kind of what you do. An example of that um, is the, the uh, Black Wall Street uh, opportunities that were made available through black empowerment, through black business ownership in Oklahoma. I took my daughters, I have four daughters, so I took them to that site so they could actually see the museum. The site is now a university campus but just on the outskirts of the campus, the museum still exists. And this was an area where you had bustling business. You had theaters, you had doctors, dentists. I mean, shopping, commerce was, I mean, just far mm -hmm. all over that particular area in terms, of it, in terms of its breadth and depth of access for black people who were millionaires at, at a time that was uh, probably more challenging to become a millionaire than it is today, possibly. Mm -hmm. Maybe not, you know, I don't know what, what the, the climate was like because I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. However, it just seems like um, we could be able to access more than they did at that time and they were successful. However, the same systems, the same institutional racism and, st and structural systems, um, unfortunately uh, caused a ruckus and burnt down the communities that they built and they killed the people. They killed the people and so, you know, you may cringe at what I'm saying to you, and you may cringe at hearing this, but it's, it's a harsh reality, and I believe that it's partly uh, the reason why black people have a fear to some extent of unifying and really moving forward at a cadence to change mm -hmm. and to develop together because of fear. You know, this is a good point about bringing in those riots. I mean, as you, you, you hadn't arrived yet, but obviously, talking with the 1919 riots, and the ones in Tulsa, I'm thinking, is, is where you were? Was it in, in yes, Oklahoma? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. I think they were in 21 or 19. I can't remember which one yet. So there was something happening, obviously, across the country uh, in the face of this advancement. But let me ask you this, though. 
So, you know, we go through the cycle of those, of those 100 years, right, where uh, there was black entrepreneurship and all those things because, you know, we had to, right? And then um, the riots happened, but then also integration happens, and some of these uh, resources we had in our community begin to dissipate, go, go elsewhere. Um, do you see a time that we're at, do, do you see that, are we at a time where it's time to pull those back? Will they, will, will they come back organically? Where, where, where do you see us in that, in that cycle now? So I'm an optimist, yet I'm also a realist. I don't know if that's possible, but, but I guess it is because that's who I am to some d extent. Uh, yes, I do believe that there's hope, and I do believe that there are individuals who are business owners and or have an entrepreneurial spirit who have begun to build their business and the biggest thing that they face at this juncture could be access to capital. That's been a common issue for most business owners or um, budding entrepreneurs. And if we can, again, pull those dollars together, as opposed to shopping, you know, buying the latest designer this or designer that, you know, I was one of those persons too, where I spent a lot of time in the mall, but life circumstances and my mindset changing forced me to think about things in a different way and about what's really important. And it wasn't the clothing, it wasn't the things that actually have the value, but to be able to own something. Um, actually, I had, a, and I'll share very personally, I was in a situation when you talk about uh, moving, migrating from place to place. So I moved from the west side of Chicago, moved to Oak Park, moved my family uh, to Bellwood, and I moved my family to Plainfield. And you know, the, the thought was, okay, well you move further away because the education is better, right, better. But what I realized when my second, my two middle daughters wrote a book with about 13 other co-authors, they talked about, well, my parents felt like it was great to move away but what they didn't realize is that they exposed me to more racism than maybe I would have experienced, you know, in the place where they came from. And we think we're doing a better job by moving, but not so much. It could cause more trauma than, than realized. So realizing all of that and actually being in a situation where I lost everything, lost everything, lost the home that I thought I owned. If you don't have the deed, you don't own it. So I thought I owned it, right? But I lost that, I lost everything, and boy, did my mindset change. So those things that were material didn't matter to me as much. What mattered to me at that moment was, wow, I should have been owning some things. And then I looked around and I saw all the stuff and realized, okay, this stuff really has no value. But ownership of land, ownership of real estate, ownership of your education, ownership of your spirituality, ownership of legacy. So legacy for me is where it is. And so now I leave that for my, my children. Of, I have four daughters. So I leave that for my children, a different mindset than I had before. And all the while, the legacy of unity. Mm -hmm. Some people may say, oh, well, yeah, I know that. But are you practicing it? What does it look like for you? What, what, is, what is your trajectory for uh, having a legacy that is not only something that you value, but generations to come, they value as well. And that's not clothing. Now to jump forward a little bit, uh, we got a new mayor coming in, new city council coming in. If you were advising them both in terms of housing and, and, and in terms of um, a more successful West Side and the role that they can play, what would you tell them? The biggest thing that we're facing is housing issues, right? Economic development, public safety, and right out of the gate, we need more of an economy in, on the west side of Chicago. There's been so much divestment in the Chicagoland area, particularly west side of Chicago. Uh, a lot of investment downtown, a lot of investment in the West Loop, but not on the west side of Chicago. And some, some investment on the south side, but the west side has not received any. And so that would be my message to her. We, we definitely want to make certain that we have the same kind of stores and or better in our communities. So we have access to a grocery store that has good quality food, not expired food, not when you come in it smells, but something that you can actually go to and feel good about consuming. So fresh produce is important. We need to be able to have the, that in the community. We need to be able to have recreational opportunities, a, a theater that is, that is thriving, a, dining restaurant that's thriving, 
everything that you need to have access to. It doesn't have to be an anchor store. It could be small businesses that are providing access, that, that they have access to capital so they can open some of the stores where we could actually frequent to purchase the things that we need. Do you, do you, should there be a, a plan for the West Side that, that the city, that city Hall says, look, we're going to carve out this piece of the, we're going to pay special attention to the West Side in order to give them the things they want. Like what, like, mm -hmm. what do you think she ought to, how do, how do you think she ought to go about this? So this? to your point, there are plans for the West Side. So communities have actually been working on a comprehensive plan for the community. So for example, Garfield, Austin, North Lawndale all have quality of life plans that have been created. And those quality of life plans outline various issue areas, whether it be housing, economic development, education, public safety. They have outlined a number of areas that need to be worked on and provided solutions. So there have been goals and strategies that have been set forth in a written document mm -hmm. to execute. So the, the, the mayor-elect has access to these documents because we've actually had some preliminary meetings with mayor-elect and some of these issues have been raised. And to her benefit, and actually I should say compliment, she has created transition teams. And those transition teams are actually um, covering those issue areas from the various communities on the west side and south sides of Chicago. They're included. Good, good, good. I, I want to go to Brad for a second. How much time do you got left, Brad? Yeah. All right, so, so uh, you can ask questions afterwards. We covered a lot in a little space, and we need to cover more. Uh, maybe if, if the doc, you can get, get to the good doctor before she gets to the door, uh, you can ask some questions. Now, um, I need to move on to, um, and thank, well, first of all, let me just say this. Thank you very much uh, for it. Give me a round of applause. Now, we have time for one more survey on the, on the, on the phone, one more poll, um, and Brad is gonna get it together now. Just uh, to give a little feedback on the day, what you learned for today. And I guess that set up another round of applause for our fine panelists. Speaker here. You got it? So, all right, yeah. so uh, this, this is a, a survey, a follow-up survey. Uh, on, as we finish up today, a wrap-up question. Again, you go to the same website, use a different code, uh, and uh, tell us your reflections on this program. But uh, we also want to announce some of our, our future programs. Uh, and Lee, you can... Oh, um, coming up uh, June 1st at the Harold Washington Library, the Pritzker Auditorium, uh, um, a program on segregation and public education, separate but not equal, 20th century Chicago. We didn't talk about schools in the West Side. That could have been a whole other, a whole other thing. Speakers are Jen Johnson, Chief of Staff to the Chicago Teachers Union and a former teacher. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Todd Breeland, uh, Assistant Professor of History at the University of Illinois Chicago, and our very own Liesl Olson, from the uh, Director of Chicago Studies for the New Newberry Library, she'll be the moderator. Uh, second program is going to be boy 63 Boycott, Film Screening and Discussion. Have you, let me ask, how many of you have seen this, this film before? It's good. It's good, if I can recommend it. Uh, 63 Boycott, that's the same place uh, at the Harold Washington Library, Ju June 1st, uh, 2.30 to 4.30, film screening and, and discussion. 63 Sh Chicago Public Schools Boycott, one of the largest um, northern civil rights demonstrations of the 60s. Looks, looks at the players, looks back at, all, at, it, at it all, it's pretty good. The panel that'll follow it will have Dr. Tracy Matthews, Executive Director of the Center, of, uh, Center for Race and the Center for, for the Study, I don't think this is right, Executive Director for the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture at the University of Chicago, and she's one of the filmmakers of this documentary, and Gordon Quinn, founder and artistic director of Cartimquin Films. Uh, both, all of this is free, obviously, registration is required, and you can go to the website, chicago1919.org slash events to get all hooked up. Brett? Uh, and, and with that, we're done for the day. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for all the panelists. Thank you, thank you.